So yeah, thank you. As Celine has said, I'm going to be presenting on um, essentially a large part of um, my DPhil and my DPhil work, but I'm really honing in on the current area of research, which um, as Celine has outlined, is um, the results of a recent survey and workshop aiming to capture the highest priorities for pharmacovigilance in low and middle income countries during the COVID pandemic. Um, some of you may have seen this survey when it was shared and the workshop and maybe even participated. Uh, but before I move on to that, I want to start with a quick outline. So I'm going to begin with a background to the wider project, um, my thesis and the, uh, the overall project itself, including a discussion of the rationale and methods. I'll then move on to um, a discussion of the survey design and the results. And then a similar thing for the workshop that I've mentioned, um, a quick discussion of the conclusions so far, and then the next steps and the Q&A afterwards. So very briefly before I start, um, I'm not going to spend too long on um, the definitions and the backgrounds of pharmacovigilance, but pharmacovigilance is defined as the science and activities relating to the detection, assessment, understanding, and prevention of adverse effects of any medicine-related problem. That's a definition from the WHO. Essentially, the fundamental aim of the science is to limit harm to patients and promote the safe and effective use of medicine. And so with that in mind, the wider project that um, this current research is embedded in seeks to understand if a community of practice approach can improve pharmacovigilance capacity in low resource settings. And so I've given a brief description of pharmacovigilance and its remits, um, and I appreciate this is quite a text heavy slide to start with, so I apologize for that, but I do think it gives a good outline of uh, the overall rationale for the project. But essentially, undertaking effective drug safety monitoring can be particularly challenging in low resource settings due to a lack of infrastructure, weak regulatory systems, and limited access to training and education opportunities. This project looks to harness the membership of an online pharmacovigilance hub, globalpharmacovigilance.org, and explore its potential to work together in a community of practice on specific challenges facing pharmacovigilance in low resource settings. Now, this online uh, pharmacovigilance hub, Global Pharmacovigilance, exists as a um, member hub of the Global Health Network. Um, it has uh, over 6,000 members currently um, around the globe. I think we're close to 6,500 now. And its position on the Global Health Network also means that we um, can encourage interaction and knowledge sharing and resource sharing with um, researchers, healthcare professionals, um, engaged in a wide range of activities in other areas and other research areas based on the Global Health Network. I've mentioned the term community of practice quite a few times, so I thought it'd be a good idea to define exactly what that is. Um, we can define it as a group of people who share a concern, a set of problems, or a passion about a topic, and who deepen their knowledge and expertise in this area by interacting on an ongoing basis. And this is a concept that was coined and explored in detail in the early 90s by social anthropologists um, Jean Labe and Etienne Wenger. And their postulation was that education, uh, knowledge generation, should not just take place in the classroom environment. And that uh, learning is an inherently social process. Um, social interaction and personal relationships are key to knowledge sharing and personal development. And so Etienne Wenger's later expansion on community of practice theory identified three elements of community of practice um, that form their structures. Uh, these are the domain, the community, and practice. Now domain here is the subject of focus for the community, um, the theme that unites the community in a common goal. The community is the individuals who come together to learn and make up the, the body of the community of practice as it were, and address a common challenge. And practice, which is perhaps the hardest to define in this instance, is um, a set of shared approaches or common approaches to a certain uh, domain or a certain task. Um, the best way to perhaps conceptualize that at the moment is to think of the idea of good manufacturing practice or good clinical practice um, sets of uh, defined ideas and methods to address common areas. I've just skipped ahead a little bit there, but you notice that we have, as I've mentioned, an existing community in the members of this Global Pharmacy Vigilance Hub. As I mentioned, it was launched in 2016, and since then we've amassed over 6,000 members worldwide. It's actually close to 6,500 now. 
And we also have a high usage in LMICs, which includes mainly India, South Africa, Egypt, and the Philippines. And so our domain, as mentioned in the overall project, is farm co-vigilance in low resource settings. We have our community, which is made up of the global farm co-vigilance members, and we have, in general, a practice, which are the um, farm co-vigilance standards and um, practices that guide how uh, safety reporting is done. So with this potential community of practice in mind, uh, this project, as I've identified, looks to understand exactly what the current priorities are for medicine safety in um, low resource settings during the pandemic. So I'll explain each of these aspects in detail shortly, but we had the first step of a knowledge uh, synthesis phase. This included both a um, traditional literature search and a scoping review to identify um, uh, areas of concern from the literature and from various workshops and discussion with farm co-vigilance experts. Uh, we then wanted to run a survey of the farm co-vigilance membership, our community, to identify what their thoughts on the current priorities for farm co-vigilance are from what we've identified in the knowledge synthesis phase. The next step was to run an online workshop where the themes identified in the survey were discussed in greater detail. And finally, the next step is the is a plan to form working groups to identify these top priorities that we've identified from both the survey and the workshop. I should say here that this project um, follows a methodology of participatory action research in that each of these steps here will undergo a process of um, research, action, and then reflection, which will inform the next step. So you see that our knowledge synthesis step informs our survey, the outcomes of our survey inform uh, the design and um, dissemination of our workshop and the results of our workshop inform what we do with the working groups. And I'll explain that in a little more detail shortly. So starting with the survey, the aims of the recent survey were primarily to identify and prioritize pharmacovigilance knowledge gaps in LMICs with specific relation to the COVID-19 pandemic. We also sought to gather demographic data to better understand the population that makes up this pharmacovigilance community of practice. And perhaps the more tertiary aims were to assess attitudes towards pharmacovigilance within that community, and also to gather data on the usage and user experience of the pharmacovigilance hub. Um, as I've mentioned from the knowledge synthesis, from our literature review and our scoping review, we identified 43 uh, pharmacovigilance themes, topics within medicine safety that were being highlighted as current areas for improvement. And these were grouped into five overarching themes within the survey. Um, again, I'll elaborate a little bit more on those later. But essentially during the survey, our members were asked, do they need to know more about these specific areas within pharmacovigilance? You can see this was an area that was specific to uh, general vaccine pharmacovigilance, and it perhaps um, included some of the more introductory and um, uh, base elements of pharmacovigilance, including terminology, how to recognize adverse events, um, and then I'll explain the other themes uh, in detail shortly. The survey was distributed um, in September 2021, it was live for five weeks, and was um, put live on the pharmacovigilance hub, on social media, and also was um, distributed by the pharmacovigilance, the global pharmacovigilance email lists and limitation emails as well. So, in terms of demographics, the survey received 155 responses from 54 countries. You can see this on this Atlas chart here. Of those 54 countries, 38 were uh, lower middle income countries, around 70%. But the key figure is that of the overall respondents, which was 155, 85% um, were based in low middle income countries. Of those based in high income countries, they were asked to identify their um, interest in pharmacovigilance and LMICs. And this interest ranged from um, active work or previous work um, supporting pharmacovigilance activities in LMICs or um, a personal interest in the subject. What you can see from here is the majority of our respondents to the survey were um, based in either in India or Kenya, but we also have good responses from the rest of um, West, South and East Africa, um, Latin America, uh, Southeast Asia as well. And I think it demonstrates a good uh, distribution of responses from the Global South, including um, 
but in addition to uh, Europe and um, Oceania. A wide range of roles was represented uh, within the community, um, pharmacists being the uh, most prevalent role, but also um, large representation of the academic community, um, healthcare professionals in general, so doctors, nurses, we had dentists, and then perhaps more specialized pharmacovigilance roles like pharmacovigilance scientists and qualified people for pharmacovigilance. Um, we're well aware that many people who work in medicine safety wear many hats and have different roles. And so um, almost half, 45% of respondents indicated that they hold more than one role. A wide range of institutions was also represented. Again, um, the academic sector, you can see university and college there was very widely represented, but also um, the hospital sector, if you combine both the public and the private sector was well represented as well. So, in terms of the current priorities. As I mentioned earlier, 43 topics were listed in the survey, and these were grouped in five different themes. What I'm going to present here is a top 10 of these 43 topics that were prioritized by our community in the survey. So to simplify things, these topics were grouped by theme. As I mentioned, the one we saw earlier was general vaccine pharmacovigilance. But we also had a theme relating to uh, COVID-19 vaccine pharmacovigilance, uh, vaccine pharmacovigilance according to patient group, pharmacovigilance of medicines used to manage COVID-19, and pharmacovigilance systems and communication during the pandemic. As I said, we'll be presenting a top 10 of these themes of the overall priorities, but you can group these by theme. These, the size of these fears is representative of the frequency of these themes in our top 10 priorities. So you can see that the third theme, um, topics that were grouped according to um, COVID vaccine patient group were very much represented in the top 10 list of priorities. We also saw equal representation of uh, the pharmacovigilance of COVID-19 medicines, uh, systems and communication, and uh, COVID-19 vaccine PD in the top 10. We didn't see any of the more general vaccine pharmacovigilance topics ranked particularly highly, highly in our areas um, of prioritization at the moment. But breaking this down further into the, uh, the actual topics, this uh, diagram shows our top 10 list of pharmacovigilance priorities. They're listed on the left-hand side, going from our highest ranked priority to the lowest. Um, what you can see on the blue bars on the left is the level of agreement that respondents indicated that they need to know more about that particular area. So the further to the left that the entirety of the blue shade goes, that indicates a level of agreement. The lighter blue being somewhat agree, the darker blue being strongly agree. So you can see for our top priority, that was the safety of COVID-19 medicines in special patient groups, almost 95% of the respondents indicated that they need to know more about that topic. And there's quite a high and close level of agreement in this top 10. It ranges between about 92% to 95% agreement that respondents need to know more about these areas. Now, I appreciate in this list format, it's not perhaps um, the most uh, straightforward uh, list to, to classify and to understand. So we can break that back down into our themes that I showed earlier, um, here classified by color. And this makes a little bit more sense of this diagram. You can see that in the top 10 themes, uh, topics from the theme of um, vaccine safety according to patient group uh, featured very highly in the top sense. So we have four incidences of um, them occurring and then equal incidences of the other smaller spheres as well. But breaking those priorities down, when we look at vaccine safety according to patient group, uh, we can see that there's quite a range of groups that are identified. So we have the safety of COVID-19 vaccination in children and adolescents, um, the safety of COVID-19 vaccination in people who are immunosuppressed, um, the safety of COVID-19 vaccination in people with existing comorbidities, and the safety of COVID-19 vaccination in pregnancy. Sort of staying on this theme of grouping safety by patient group, if we also look at our theme of um, pharmacovigilance according to COVID-19 medicines, we also see in that category that one of the most highest ranked topics was the safety of COVID-19 medicines in special patient groups. 
What we can also see across the board is an interest in drug-drug and vaccine-drug interactions. So both an interest in the interactions of COVID-19 medicines and the interactions of the vaccines ranked very highly in our overall 43 themes. We also see concerns relating to um, how to communicate COVID-19 vaccine safety information, uh, safety data analysis, and um, a desire to understand more about ongoing global COVID-19 pharmacovigilance work and the global pharmacovigilance landscape. In addition to gathering all of this um, quantitative data by, uh, by means of a liquid scale, we also asked for um, feedback for people to expand on their responses and with free text questions and to give, um, give us some qualitative data. Um, there was an enormous amount of qualitative data generated. I'm not going to go through it all, but I thought it would be uh, useful just to identify um, from our most common theme, that is um, COVID-19 vaccine pharmacovigilance according to patient group, uh, some of the uh, areas that people wanted to expand on in the survey. And so, for example, when we look at um, one of the themes, which was uh, COVID-19 vaccine safety in uh, people with comorbidities, we see that chronic illness and disability was an area that people had a real interest in, especially in those with cancer. Um, endocrine diseases and autoimmune diseases were um, of great interest as well. And we also see people expanding on uh, items in the survey, for example, in children and adolescents, people wanted to understand about research on vaccinating neonates, and in rela relation to pregnancy as well, um, there was an interest in understanding the safety of vaccination in women planning, planning pregnancy. And there are a great amount of overlaps in the, the topics and themes that are sort of encompassed by these areas. It's all quite a broad um, description at the moment of various pharmacovigilance themes. And so what we wanted to do is narrow that down and really understand where the consensus lies as to exactly what it is for these topic areas that people want to know more about. And so for that reason, we decided to host a online open workshop. Um, as I've mentioned, part of the reason we wanted to do this is because we identified a very broad range of priorities. We wanted to understand exactly what it was about these areas that um, people wanted to know more about. I've also identified that in our top 10, there was a very close grouping of levels of agreement. So we wanted to perhaps um, allow a more robust examination of exactly which of these people were um, ranking the highest. But perhaps more importantly, we wanted to understand how these top 10 priorities related to our communities, um, individual settings. Uh, have they experienced any, um, uh, had they come up against any problems with these um, priorities themselves? Have they experienced it in their practice? Have they done any research in this area and how it affected them? And so we held this uh, online workshop last Thursday. Again, some of the people on this call may have attended. Thank you very much if you did. Um, it had the format of two presentations, uh, one which was to give a background into global pharmacovigilance in the global health network, but also we presented the results of this recent survey that we've discussed so far in this, uh, in this webinar and the priorities identified. We then had an hour long open discussion to encourage the attendees to elaborate on whether they thought these priorities were relevant to their setting, whether there were now greater priorities as the survey itself was run four months ago, and to talk more generally about their experience with these areas. And then finally, we ran a poll in the workshop to list these top 10 priorities and ask people to identify from the top 10 if they were to pick a top three, what would they say the highest priorities for pharmacovigilance in their setting is right now? Um, this workshop was very gratefully chaired by um, a group from the International Society of Pharmacovigilance. Um, the International Society of Pharmacovigilance has um, regional chapters, and we were very fortunate to have the, um, the workshop chaired by the ISOP Africa chapter, who uh, facilitated the running of the workshop and the discussion as well. As I mentioned, we ran a workshop poll, which sought to um, identify the three highest priorities from the 10 identified in the survey. The 10 identified in the survey are listed here in no particular order. Um, as I said, we looked to assess the relevance of the priorities to the attendee setting. And there was also a shift. In the survey, we sought primarily to identify where the knowledge gaps lay, 
But now we look to really consolidate exactly what the priorities for support and training and guidance were, and to sort of validate that knowledge gap approach to identifying priorities. Now, um, we had some technical glitches at the end of the workshop in relation to the poll and identifying our priorities. So we have run a post workshop poll to a um, uh, survey, sorry, to uh, gather data from those that weren't able to identify or weren't able to see the poll in the workshop. So what I'm not going to present now is our top three priorities. What I will just quickly demonstrate is some uh, demographic data. We had 257 attendees, 61 countries were represented. And um, of those attendees, um, almost 80% were based in LMICs. Again, uh, this shows a good, I think, geographic spread of attendees and good representation from the local cell. Just a quick comparison with the survey respondents. You can see that we do get a lot of um, interaction with this community from Kenya and Southern and East Africa, and also India and um, South America as well. So conclusion so far, Global Pharmacovigilance Vigilance's membership is a diverse global community representing a broad range of Pharmacovigilance Vigilance stakeholders with a large membership base in LMICs. And this I think is demonstrated from our demographic data. In terms of the priorities for Pharmacovigilance Vigilance at the moment, they are, as I've mentioned, to be determined. Um, I'd say watch this space. The, uh, our survey um, following the workshop is due to close on Friday, and we'll have a far greater idea then of exactly how these priorities are going to be ranked. What we can say is that there is a need for greater information and guidance on the safety of COVID-19 vaccine therapeutics in different clinical groups in LMICs. We can also make very similar conclusions in relation to drug-drug and vaccine-drug interactions. Um, and again, further research is needed on um, the need to improve communication and uh, safety data analysis, and also an awareness of the global PV landscape too. As I've alluded to, the next steps of this work will be to form working groups to address the priorities identified from our survey that were then carried forward into the working groups, and that will be identified from this working group poll when that closes. The groups will be formed to address the highest priorities identified, and all participants of the workshop and all members of Global Pharmacovigilance, our Pharmacovigilance community of practice will be invited to join the working groups. Members of the working groups will be invited to work together to address the highest ranked priorities with the support of the Global Health Network and using the Global Pharmacovigilance platform as a space for communication, learning and dissemination of outputs. These are my references. I appreciate that was a very quick run through of quite a large and complex project, but thank you very much.